Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. When our program first debuted in the 1950s, it was conceived as a way to share information with farmers about the best agricultural practices and advice about animal husbandry. And on today's program, we're going back to those roots and digging even deeper to talk about how to be a farmer. This pocket-sized guide brings classical philosophy and knowledge to the modern audience and covers everything from asses to agriculture to the countryside and compost. To help us plow through all this ancient wisdom, we are joined by Mark D. Usher. He is, among other things, a UVM classics professor and self-described hard scrabble farmer, and the author of several books, including How to Be a Farmer, An Ancient Guide to Life on the Land. Welcome. It's great to have you here. I love your work. Well, it's an honor to be on the oldest ag program on television, <laughs> so thank you. Awesome that you know that. So before we talk about your book, um, tell us about your life as a farmer. Your farm is located in Shoreham, Vermont. It's called Works and Days Farm, which is a reference to the Greek poet Hesiod. Yep. Uh, what came first, academics or agriculture? Well, I hate to spoil the alliteration on that one, but uh, <laughs> carpentry actually came first. Uh, I, when I graduated from high school, I did a two-year apprenticeship in Germany as a post and beam carpenter. Uh, mm. Met my wife, uh, discovered the Lake District in England. She's from Britain, mm. and uh, decided that maybe I'd want to be a sheep farmer too. So uh, came back to the States after we got married and uh, ended up doing both. Um, so uh, we bought land, built our house, uh, and then started raising animals, uh, all part of a, a design. Um, and uh, so academics, I think, would, came second. So, um, uh, though I'm happy for my day job. Okay, well, <laughs> clearly you're quite educated because this book has both the Greek and Latin and English um, translations of really interesting uh, people. Your first translation in the book is from the poet Hesiod. Mm -hmm. uh, who was he and why did you choose for your first chapter the passage, Keeping Up with the Joneses, uh, Livelihood is Hard to Come By? So Hesiod was uh, one of our uh, one of the first poets in the Western tradition. So along with Homer, he he writes in uh, a poetic language, and um, he's the first person who kind of uses the the first person I and speaks in mm. his own person. Um, and he was an immigrant from um, uh, modern Turkey, Asia Minor, and he came to Greece and started a new life. His father uh, was the was the first generation. So he speaks both as a, a farmer and agriculturalist, but also as uh, uh, first generation, you know, uh, transplant, right. as it were. And uh, so he has a very interesting perspective on uh, hard work and uh, living close to the land in contradistinction perhaps to other ways of making a living which are perhaps not so honest. Right. Um, and, y you know, what's really interesting to me is as a translator, y you know, you have to have take some liberties, and, and you do to make it more... Mm, comfortable for us yep. in these days time. So there probably were a few Joneses uh, <laughs> back in, in Greece. Um, tell us a little bit about your translations and, and, and how you went about doing that. Great. Well, uh, so yes, the, the titles of each uh, uh, chapter in the, in the book are, are modern. They're not translations from, from the ancients, but it's, a, it's to capture the imagination of a modern audience and get them interested in it. So keeping up with the Joneses is, of course, you know, uh, trying to make your living vis-a-vis -vis your neighbor and other people. Uh, by hard graft, um, and the idea that that others' success can spur you on to greater success. Very old idea, and right. Hesiod talks about it in exactly those terms. Like, you see your neighbor flourishing, it inspires you to work hard. Right, because um, he's been working hard, that's why he's flourishing, exactly. right? Exactly, so that's the idea about behind keeping up with the Joneses. Um, so. Talk a little bit, you, you can't though have the rhythm and the sound of Greek uh, when you're translating, or so, some, you know, you can try. Right. Um, so would you be willing to give us an, an example about how the Greek sounds yeah. uh, from Hesiod, and then we'll talk a little bit about how, what, what your work is to, to make that feel, give that feel to us. Good, so uh, a, a poet close to home, Robert Frost, said um, good fences make good neighbors. Hesiod has a lot of advice about neighbors, too, as you can imagine, uh, living in an agricultural community. And here in English is what he says um, about uh, uh, a bad neighbor. Mm -hmm. And then I'll read it in Greek for you. Okay. A bad neighbor is as much a pain as a good one is a blessing. The man whose portion includes a good neighbor 
possesses something of value. Not even a cow would be lost unless the neighbor's a bad one. <laughs> and in Greek, Pema kakos geton, hason tagatos meganear, emore toi times, hos emore getonos eslu. Udan bus apoloito, eme geton kakos ee. So it does have a beautiful kind of song to it. It's the same uh, meter as Homer composed in. So the Iliad and the Odyssey, this is that, that language that Hesiod is composing in. And Hesiod, I should say, was a shepherd, and he received his call to poetry from the muses, as he tells us in another poem he wrote called The Theogony. So uh, poetry was very much part of his profession as well as agriculture. Right, and I think it's great that you have the Latin and the Greek here. If you can't read the Greek, maybe That's you right. can read the Latin. <laughs> so Hesiod is, is fond of, of the dignity of a hard day's work and the self-satisfaction and self-sufficiency that comes with working the land. Um, was he preaching to the choir or, 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 or making a statement? He was making a statement, um, clearly, uh, and he, he dedicates this work, not dedicates it, he uses the occasion to write this work um, as a, uh, a, a quarrel with his brother, Perses. Mm. And Perses, says Hesiod, was too concerned with like town affairs and getting involved mm. in lawsuits and trying to make a living dishonestly, perhaps um, not by hard graft. And so Hesiod writes this as a, kind of a, uh, uh, an alternative uh, that he's giving advice that hard work is how you get you get right. food in your barn and and grain in your in your silos. Right. Don't um, don't hang out in town. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so so beyond uh, work, farming is all also about land and, and boundaries. Yeah. Um, uh, talk about the politics and in some cases legal counsel that comes from some of these writings you've gathered. Mm. Yeah, so Lisa, one of the things that Perseus did was unfairly divide the inheritance between them. Ah. So, so he's actually, uh, he's either complaining about that and saying like, you, you've been dishonest with, with me. So that, there's a subtext in the, in the poem about that. But um, you know, while, while you know, private land ownership was definitely a part and parcel of Hesiod's world, there was also the whole phenomenon of the commons, meaning public lands mm. that people, uh, farmers could, could graze um, uh, at, at will and use cooperatively, something that you know, we've lost to, to, to some extent in the, mm -hmm. in the modern world or, or it's been de-emphasized. And so the, the Greek city was always set up as a, the town, which was called the astu, and the kora, which was the surrounding area. And oftentimes people, even if they lived in town, they would have like plots outside the, sure. and they would come in at the end of the agricultural day and, and come back to town to live, but they worked out in the, in the fields. So that was kind of the, the Right, the but a lot scheme. of sharing going on too. A lot of sharing, yeah. and that's why he uh, puts a premium on, on neighbors. Well, it's interesting, you also have, um, pieces from Plato's Republic, one of the, mm. the, the more, more f famous masterpieces. What does Plato have to say about the role of farmers in society? Well, interesting, not, not many people will know. People think of Plato and they think of like the utopian ideal society of philosopher mm -hmm. kings and a very structured society. But uh, he, he, uh, he engages in a thought experiment in the Republic at the very beginning. And he said, if I had my druthers, the way society would be run, let's, how would a city come to be? And he says, people need one another people cooperate and he says you need a farmer you need a blacksmith mm -hmm. you need mm -hmm. you know and he, the, the 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 amount of the, the number of, of professions you need are minimal and farmers are one of those professions and he says how would these people live and he has a wonderful passage that i translate in the in the mm -hmm. book uh, of of this utopian bucolic society where people are are living close to the land they don't need too much they don't want too much they're happy with what they have they have enough right. uh, they don't produce children beyond their means so there's not pop mm. overpopulation there's not a need for war or encro encroaching on other people's territory so for him plato says this is the ideal this society is this is the healthy one but he says that's not the way things are, and so the rest of the republic is sort of an antidote or a solution to the problems that Athenians in the fourth century BCE actually faced. So it's remedial. The republic is prescriptive, and it's a it's a way to kind of fix the problems of society. But if Plato had a druthers, it would be an agricultural society right. living close to the land. Well, as you say, <laughs> this is 2,400 years ago. This is over well over you know. Uh, 2,000 mm. years ago. How do students respond to this work and, and in what ways is it still relevant? Mm. Excellent question and surprisingly well. Students respond 
to Plato, uh, I'm always surprised um, with delight. He was a sort of proto-feminist. He believed that women should have complete equal access to ed education and to involvement in politics. This is in a time where uh, 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 women weren't Athenian citizens, and mm. never mind, they couldn't vote. Um, and he also believed that you know women should be in the military. Um, so he was very forward-thinking and uh, you know radical in many ways um, for his time. So students see that he was also um, a, a communitarian. He really believed in cooperative values. Um, his very definition of justice is like a harmony amongst parts, mm. both in a person's soul, but also in society. And students uh, are are very attuned to this, and they think that this is something that could, could well, work for us well, for and for them. Yeah. Right. Humans haven't changed all that much. So at the start of the program, I mentioned asses, and <laughs> I want our viewers to know that I just wasn't being just a little cheeky. Yeah. Uh, you include a passage on, on asses by the ancient author um, Camilla? Camilla? Columella. Columella. Yes. Yeah. What does he say about these wonderful beasts of burden? Uh, he says they're uh, marvelously enduring and patient. Um, they, they get by on practically no food at all. They can eat sticks and straw, he says. <laughs> so they make them very useful in pretty much any part of the Roman Empire that you could use them. Um, they were the indispensable form of mechanization and, and transport um, in antiquity. So they carried things hither and thither, no tractors back then. Um, and uh, they also turned the millstone which mm. ground, uh, you know, flour, uh, but also uh, olives. So that was a, a big, they were an indispensable Huge. tool, easy right. I mean, uh, Kali Mello says. And, and you've raised and worked with donkeys on your own farm. How applicable is his <laughs> advice and well, uh, his thoughts? Yes, we do have donkeys. They're called Turks and Caicos, which is where we'd <laughs> rather be in a Vermont <laughs> winter. Um, and they were rescue donkeys, um, and so they're pretty much pets. We don't use them to turn the millstone, but believe me, they are single-minded. Uh, they are stubborn. They're patient. Um, you cannot get a donkey to go through a gate. It doesn't want to. Um, you have to incentivize it, make All it think its own is idea. True too. <laughs> so uh, that brings us to the end of our program in so many ways. Mark, thank you so much. The book is How to Be a Farmer, An Ancient Guide to Life on the Land. It's delightful. Um, may the gods smile on <laughs> your farm and you have great bounty this summer. Uh, thank you very much. I hope they do. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well. <laughs>